Thank you very much, Dr. Peterson, for responding to the video that we did on you and that characterized you as a mirror of wokeism. Um, in this video, I pointed out that today society is characterized by a conflict between two opposite wings of the same civil religion. One wing is wokeism, the other wing is represented by you. But you weren't happy with this and you asked me a question. So I'm going to try to answer the question now. Jordan Peterson complained about a number of things in the video we did. And number one, he said that I misunderstood or oversimplified his thought, and especially regarding his core idea of the sovereign individual. And then secondly, he was unhappy that I unduly highlighted his anger. And thirdly, he thought I was strawmanning him as doing self-help, and depicting this genre somewhat negatively. Then, uh, he didn't like that I was framing him, to quote him, as if what I am doing is a Baudrillard-esque spectacle. On top of that, he also found that I depreciated his take on Nietzsche as outdated and unscholarly. Then he asked a question. He said, uh, it seems that you are saying, me, all we offer to the world is something akin to an approval-seeking set of false selves with nothing genuine at the bottom. I ask you in all seriousness, is that a philosophy or is it a confession? Now, I want to address all of these points, working up to answering the question. And while I'm doing this, I hope I will be able to clear up some misunderstandings. And I'd like to highlight right away that my point, of course, is not only to answer his question, but to better understand Jordan Peterson as a, or perhaps even the, major public intellectual or even spiritual figure of today. So it's not just about understanding him and not primarily about understanding him as a person, but about saying something about our society in general. And as always, the point is to be critical, but not to be judgmental. Let me start with a correction and an apology. Jordan Peterson pointed out rightly that I somewhat misrepresented his thought by saying that it is built on an idea of individual rationality. That is not precise. What he says instead of rationality is uh, something different, namely he uses the term logos. So let's hear what Jordan Peterson actually has to say, and uh, we listen to a few videos and then try to summarize what he actually says in four simple steps. So we'll go step by step. Let's look at these uh, short clips here. I'm helping them find words to express things that they already knew to be true, and those things that they know to be true are the bedrock axioms of our culture. And one of the things we got right in the West was the idea of the sovereign, responsible individual. And so I think that there isn't anything more meaningful or real than the idea of individual sovereignty. Then our cultural and legal systems wrap themselves tightly around that ultimately unlikely narrative of individual sovereignty and made it their central, unshakable pillar. In these clips that we just listened to, Peterson says three things all about the sovereign individual. Number one, that it is a bedrock axiom of our culture, that it's its central unshakable pillar, and that it is the most meaningful and real idea that our culture is built on. As a second step, let's look at the next short clip that we are simultaneously accepting the proposition that every singular one of us is a divine center of logos. Here, he says that along with this most meaningful and real idea of the sovereign individual, we are also simultaneously accepting the proposition that every singular one of us is a divine center of logos. Now, following this, let's look at this clip here a divine center of the eternal word that brings habitable order into being through the voluntary, truthful confrontation with chaos and the unknown. So, 
What he's saying here is that as such divine centers of Logos, we basically actually follow God's work when he created the world and, quoting him again, in this way we bring habitable order into being through the voluntary truthful confrontation with chaos and the unknown. So this means that the task of the individual is in his or her own personal realm to take on responsibility, what I used to call to man up, and then transform chaos into order through the divine logos in which he or she somehow partakes individually. Now this brings us to the fourth step and again lo let's look at some clips. What I'd like to concentrate on very briefly is the part that makes the Declaration of Independence self-evident and that is that man and woman alike are made in the image of God. It's also not clear what being made in the image of God would mean given that by that point in the book you don't know much about God except that you do know that he uses logos to extract order out of chaos. That's about all you know. And that that's good. And so the proposition there, as far as I'm concerned, is that that's what human beings do. That's what we do. And, and that this is way more important than people think. That we are co-creators of, of reality. We actually believe this politically. Because our, our Western systems, which are quite functional, are also predicated on the idea that you're sovereign and you could keep the ship of state properly afloat and oriented in the correct direction. And our entire society is predicated on that idea as well. And so that's the responsibility. Now, importantly, Peterson is very clear here that this kind of program also is a political project and that it has already manifested itself within what he calls Western civilization, particularly in the United States and in the Declaration of Independence, which is of course a very foundational document for this political project. So, in this way, Peterson's personal man-up philosophy is at the same time also at the foundation of a political ideology. I think it's fair enough to summarize the whole idea in the following proposition. Civilized Western society is founded on the most real idea of sovereign individuals as divine centers of Logos, whose mission is, by individually repeating God's act of transforming chaos into order in their own lives, to take on responsibility of political leadership in the world. Now the main point that I want to make is that the genre of this very message is civil religion. Notions like divine center of Logos and claims about unshakable pillars of Western civilization are not precisely speaking psychological or sociological claims in an academic sense. They're not meant to be empirically proven. The message is quite clearly civil religious because it's grounded in sacred texts like the Bible and kind of semi-sacred texts like the Declaration of Independence and in the divine. The it applies directly to current politics. It formulates very strong ethical norms in the form of, I think, what needs to be called dogmas, that is, to use his words again, self-evident bedrock axioms and unshakable pillars. Importantly, again, in my understanding, this is also not philosophy, because, again, in my understanding, philosophy questions religion and questions civil religion, analyzes and presents theories, but it doesn't really aim at, as I see it, in formulating self-evident normative bedrock axioms or claiming that there are some unshakable pillars. And 
as civil religion, Peterson's approach, I think, very clearly resembles wokeness because wokeness, too, speaks in the form of self-evident bedrock axioms and unshakable pillars. And in this way, people like John McWhorter, for instance, have rightly characterized wokeness also as, in essence, a civil religious project. So, in this sense, Peterson's approach represents a religious liberal conservative wing of North American civil religion, as opposed to the progressive wing, that is wokeness. And, interestingly enough, they are both based on a strong individualistic claim of authentic identity. This brings us to the second point, namely anger, or I would even call it methodological anger. And let's look at another clip here. And if any one of us is not treated in this manner, if anyone, no matter how powerful, reacts to any of us, no matter how downtrodden, as if our free will is illusory or our role in choosing the outcomes of our lives non-existent, then we get offended and angry and agitated and insulted, and rightly so. In this clip, Peterson very explicitly embraces and emphasizes anger. Anger is an important rhetorical and emotional tool in religion and in civil religion as well. Peterson not only employs it frequently by speaking in an angry, at least somewhat angry manner, but he also justifies it explicitly. This uh, little clip that we just showed follows directly his claims about the sovereign individual and the divine center of Logos. And the point is that if these claims are not accepted, and that's his claim again, if we are not treated in this way, then we are righteously angry about it. So this obviously means that if these claims are challenged, then an emotional reaction is in order. Because given the non-negotiability of these supposedly most real ideas, any challenge to them becomes, at least to an extent, also an attack on our innermost selves, on the foundation of our society. Anger, especially in the Judeo-Christian tradition, has very often been a religious gesture. Right? If certain foundational religious beliefs are challenged, then anger is a proper reaction. And in this way, the God in the Judeo-Christian tradition is, from time to time, a quite angry God, and his representatives on earth are thereby also entitled, from time to time, to be very angry. In addition to this rhetorical emphasis on anger and this methodological use of anger, Peterson uses another rhetorical device that is civil religious in nature. He speaks increasingly, I think, uh, in his recent videos and publications, in the form of a general we. This is exactly the same way in which also the United States Declaration of Independence speaks, and other civil religious texts that are similar to that. So, thereby, he claims and establishes this almost mythological we. And intentionally or not, he also establishes, of course, thereby a distinction between us and them, between the civilized and unspoken but implied, the non-civilized, between those who share the beliefs and, so to speak, 
the heathens who don't. By the way, Jacques Derrida wrote a great essay about particularly this issue, who is the we in the Declaration of Independence, and we put a link to this essay in the description. So now let's get to the next point, a very important point, self-help. And let's look at another clip. It's, it's a lot of emotional weight. I mean, I had some, some, somebody called me this week. He just got my number sort of randomly, and he, he said, uh, who is this? I answered the phone. He said, who is this? I said, no, no, who is this? <laughs> Since he was calling me, and he said, uh, he, he told me his name. He said, are you Dr. Peterson? I said, yes. He said, really? And I said, yeah, it's, yes, really. And he just burst into tears and he just sobbed like for like five minutes uncontrollably apologizing and then he said his grandmother had died and his mother and and that he had become suicidal and you know, that his le my lectures, he'd watched a lot of them, and that, that it helped him, guide him through that. And well, I've seen a lot of that. That just happens over and over. Like it happens, I would say, four or five times a day in restaurants or in airports. Or, well, you've been experiencing that to some degree in Australia, you said. And it's, it's so good. And the mainstream media that's been covering what I've been doing you know, they just miss this completely because everything, it seems like everything that constitutes news in our society has to be political and group oriented. In this clip, Peterson rightly complains that his critics and the media tend to ignore the immense effect he has at, I think, what can be justly called a public healer. He is a civil religious healer with a massive effect. And he even participates, as we can see very clearly in this clip, in the suffering of the people he tries to heal. And he is not hesitant to display this suffering. It's a very important part of his public presentation. So he does display his healing capacities. He frequently tells stories like the one he just told in that clip. And of course, he thereby also promotes, shows, displays himself as someone who is available for healing others. And this is also how he is, uh, through his books, commercially advertised. In this way, I think Peterson functions like a megachurch or a super megachurch uh, on the internet. He undoubtedly has massive healing effects, just as religious communities have healing effects, like uh, whatever, people who suffer from alcoholism or people who have gone through very tragic events often find healing in a religious community. But at the same time, these often massive healing effects come with a, the spread of a specific message, or I would say a specific civil religious dogma. And additionally, this happens, like in the case of the mega churches in the United States, in the context of a for-profit commodification. I'm not morally judging this, I'm just pointing out the mere fact. So wokeism too does a lot of good. For instance, it fights against racism and promotes social justice. But at the same time, it is also commodified and politically appropriated, right? There is this whole sector of woke advertising and corporations apply woke gestures to sell their products. And even as we discussed in another video, the CIA embraces wokeism, and of course, major political parties uh, in the West do the same thing. This shows the ambiguity of self-help. From a Marxist perspective on religion, including civil religion, it could be said that 
religion supports the individualist capitalist ideology that produces mass individual suffering, but then it enables religious mass healers to sell efficient cures for the diseases that, at least in part, it produced in the first place. This could be said from a Marxist perspective. From a Nietzschean perspective, a perspective that Peterson sometimes claims to adopt himself, it can be said that Christian religion has always been by and for the sick. It's maintaining and healing sickness at the same time. So, from this perspective, from a Nietzschean perspective, religion is not really for the healthy. It is based on the cultivation of sickness. Well, the question can be asked, is that also the case for civil religion? From my own personal perspective, I would more highlight a third point. R. Peterson and wokeism, while performing very real healing effects, may be also simultaneously spreading a certain ideology, identity politics in the case of wokeism, a certain almost fundamentalist individualism on the other hand, that creates social divisions by over-insisting on a supposed common we of the righteous and the civilized that excludes somehow everyone who does not submit themselves to this we. So, aren't we dealing both in Peterson's case as well as in the case of wokeism with some form of moralist dogmatism that, while having strong healing effects, is also highly divisive. So, if we look at Jordan Peterson as, in essence, a civil religious figure, then the question can be asked, is he a modern-day prophet? And precisely this question was asked in the following clip. Just going back onto this issue of, of you sort of almost being a prophet in a way, do you view yourself as that? I mean, as religion declines, you go on this world tour, millions of people read your books, billions of people probably watching the videos online. Uh, do you see yourself as a sort of new religious phenomenon for people? Not new. Not new. And... I see myself as fortunate, that's how I see myself, that I have the opportunity to do this. Here, Peterson first accepts the description of himself as a civil religious prophet, but he just says he's not new. So, is he stepping in the footsteps of the ancient prophets? But soon after, he actually also rejects the same description. Let's look at this. But are you a prophet? And, uh, see, to say yes or no, I have to think about how I think I have to think about how, how I might be conceptualized, how what I'm doing might be conceptualized. No, I think I see myself as a psychologist, and fundamentally, I am a psychologist. I'm a behavioral psychologist. So, the rejection is quite hesitant, and. Interesting enough, only, as he says, in consideration of how such a label, prophet, would alter his public perception. Maybe we can say he is a reluctant prophet, as many prophets were. And again, not so different from the prophets of civil religion, such as, just to name one, very famous one, Greta Thunberg. She, too, is also something like an angry prophet. Now, let's get to the point of the Baudrillard-esque spectacle. First of all, 
um, it's a little bit unfortunate. Uh, the term should either be Debordian spectacle or maybe Baudrillesque simulacrum, because the term spectacle actually comes from Guy Debord, and Baudrillard is more famous for the notions of simulacrum or hyperreality, for that matter. And yes, I would say both concepts, the notion of the spectacle as well as the notion of the simulacrum or the hyperreal, apply to Peterson, but by no means to him alone or specifically to him. These concepts apply basically to all of contemporary society. That's the point of these concepts. And of course, especially to anything and everything that's happening in the mass or now in the social media, including this channel and this very video now. So, notions like a spectacle or simulacrum or hyperreal describe and critique contemporary society better, I think, than Peterson's concepts derived from the Bible and attach to it the popular, more secular semantics of liberalism, individualism, and what has been called the age of authenticity. The core idea of these concepts, spectacle, simulacrum, the hyperreal, is that reality does not really precede, but is formed in and through its symbolic mass representation. And that idea can be illustrated much more concretely, as I like to do with the notion of the brand in the economy, right? Just again, think about something like a Nike shoe. It's not that the actual shoes give identity to the Nike brand, but it's the Nike brand which gives identity to the shoes. And in this sense, Nike too is, to use Peterson's language, a most real idea. And it's exactly this most real idea that you pay for when you buy the shoe. In the same way, I claim, Peterson's most real idea of sovereign individuality is, in Baudrillard's language, better described as a most hyper-real idea. It's a civil religious brand. What Jordan Peterson presents us is the civil religious aspect of the brand of sovereign individuality. And we see its completely secular forms when, again, we just look at Nike advertising. Make yourself proud. Make yourself strong. Make yourself fit. These could all be Peterson slogans, and they are actually most hyper-real Nike slogans as well. Their message is very parallel. Today, people in the economy and advertising and in politics know that they become what they are and that they create their value by creating a profile. That is the same today in religion and in civil religion. Civil religion, too, follows this most real model that we see in advertising and in politics. And we see it not only with Jordan Peterson, we see it equally in wokeism. Wokeism, Peterson, and Nike all spread what could be called the gospel or the brand of authenticity. And they do so under conditions of profilicity. So, finally, let's get to Peterson's question. Is all we offer to the world something akin to an approval-seeking set of false selves, with nothing genuine at the bottom? I ask in all seriousness, is that a philosophy or is it a confession? Let me try to amend this statement a little bit. First of all, the basic idea of profilicity, following thinkers like Debord and Baudrillard, is 
that identity in our times is often, but not exclusively, achieved by curating and projecting a certain brand or a profile that is then validated by a general peer. Now, two things have to be considered here. Number one, this applies to our time, very different from Peterson's notion. What is at stake here is not a trans-historical divine logos that is in everyone. This describes a mode of producing identity, of having an identity in the present. And secondly, it's not exclusive. It's not the only identity technology that is available. So it's not all that we are. Still, I maintain that this identity technology of profilicity is very important, and especially so with regard to people like Jordan Peterson, who are very much in the focus of the media, and increasingly so through this very activity, myself. It's a central part of basically everyone's identity building today. Such profile-based selves are only falls, as Peterson claims, from the perspective of an authenticity paradigm, which I do not share. I do not see them as inherently false. People can achieve identity by being truly invested in their profiles. And I claim this is also the case, for instance, for Jordan Peterson. And it is shown in his publicly displayed emotionality that we saw earlier. It is very clear that there is a true personal investment in this case in a public profile, which emerges through social validation feedback loops with a massive general peer. The same is true also for more woke influences, like, for instance, Abigail Thorne, who we discussed in another video. I equally trust that she is truly invested in her profile, and do not think that she is simply false. Interestingly enough, both Peterson and wokeism, in different ways, insist, nevertheless, on the modern Western gospel of individual authenticity. But both do so under the increasingly obvious conditions of profilicity within which they operate. And yet, everyone, including Jordan Peterson myself, is genuine not false, but genuinely pretending. Our genuine identity is produced in and through our performance. It is not, as he says, at the bottom. I think we should simply be truthful enough, to use again Peterson's language, or critical enough, to use my language, not to cover this up and to admit it to ourselves and to others. Finally, for the sake of sanity, for the sake of minimizing anger, for the sake of promoting social and psychological ease, it may be helpful to minimize one's obsession with one's identity, be it an authentic identity or a profile-based identity. So yes, put in the way I just formulated it, this view is both a philosophy and a confession. And, like in Peterson's case, it even has a therapeutic intention. Let's not be too much invested in our identity, be it in the form of a profile or of sovereign individuality. Now let me conclude with a footnote on Nietzsche. Yes, I do believe that Peterson's take on Nietzsche is somewhat inaccurate. And I don't think it reflects the breadth of Nietzsche's ideas very well. 
I personally prefer PewDiePie's take on Nietzsche.